Good morning again. Last week's Torah portion certainly is not short on any interesting subject matter. It was Chayai Sarah. And it uh, covers Genesis chapters 23 through 25. But the rabbis chose to pair this parasha portion, this Torah portion, with 1 Kings chapter 1, which speaks of the concluding days of the king of David. And why is that significant? Because Genesis 23 through 25 speaks of the concluding days of Abraham. And so I thought, let's talk about these two men uh, today. And these two men then will be the subject of our discussion today. We're going to learn from their lives the definition of the terms walking with God, abiding in the Lord, phrases that are really key to our daily f f uh, lives and our faith. Amen. <laughs> this is because it's um, <laughs> Kayai Sarah it deals with the mysterious sh shaped animal here called the camel. Actually, there's 10 camels they can cameo in this, uh, in this story. So why is that the title for today? Well, David Biven and Roy Blizzard in their book, Understanding the Difficult Words of Yeshua, of Jesus, shed some light on the much heated terms, much heard terms, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God as used in scripture. So although we will be discussing two prominent patriarchs, our real focus today will be on their character and on their faith. Please join me as we pray for today's message. Abba Father, Lord God Almighty, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and God of David, thank you, Lord God, for giving us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to trust and to believe in you. Lord, fill us with the Ruch HaKodesh, and use us, Lord, and fill us, Lord God, to capacity that we may learn to abide in you and bear much fruit for you, for our Messiah, Yeshua. And we thank you and we praise you, Abba, in Yeshua's name. Okay, let's, um, this is be our overview of what we're going to be talking about. Abraham, the friend of God, the man of faith, also known as Abraham Avinu, and David, David Melech Israel, a man after God's own heart. What legacies, how wonderful to have these titles given to you through, his, through history. Wouldn't it be, be nice for us to be called a friend of God, a woman of faith, a man after God's own heart? Well, I propose to you this is entirely possible and something for us to, uh, to, to consider. So the three things that we're going to be uh, considering, well, in order to get to the point of actually seeing how they receive these titles, we're going to learn the answers to these three questions. Who are they? Why were they chosen by God? And how does that relate to us? So we'll start with um, Abraham. Who is Abraham and how is it that he was chosen by God to become the father of the chosen people? Well, we meet Abraham in Genesis chapter 11. He is a descendant of Shem, one of the sons of Noah. And when he is first mentioned, his name is Avram. His family lived in Ur, or also known as Ur of the Chaldeans. It's in Mesopotamia. It's labeled number one there on the slide. It's um, down there. And this will be an outline of how he got to the land of Canaan. Now, in Mesopotamia, um, where the land, where the city of Ur was located, you'll notice that it's right at the meeting place of the river Tigris and the Euphrates. It was known as an area of widespread idol worship and paganism, much like the, where we live today. His father was a successful and influential man who eventually moved the whole clan northwest to the land of Canaan. 
and, but he settled in a place called Haran. So time goes by, and it is there that the creator of heaven and earth meets with Avram and puts before him a trial and a reward of a promise. As a descendant of Noah, he knew of El Elyon, the creator of heaven and earth, the one true God. So let's examine this test that was put before him. This comes from Genesis chapter 12. It says, Now Adonai said to Avram, Get going out of your country. Leave your relatives. And leave your, um, the land that, uh, that you dwell in. Leave your father's house and get to the land which I will show you. This was to become the first of several tests or trials of his faith. Rashi and Maimonides teach that he was tested at least 10 times by God during his life. The first one called for him to desert his aging father, sever all ties with his and Sarah's past, severed ties with their loved ones, and their new homeland, which was Haran. The Lord knew that he was a man characterized by chesed, as a Hebrew word for one who is kind-hearted, someone who exhibits steadfast love. In Genesis 18, the Lord says, I have known him. In Hebrew, the word is yadeh, meaning he perceived or he recognized something personally significant about Avram. Now, you might say, well, Reg, doesn't the Lord know everyone? And true, he does. He knows our innermost th uh, thoughts and our motives. But I want to point out that the word Yadeh here speaks of a two-way intimacy that Adonai had with Avram. It is the same word used when the scripture says, Cain knew his wife. And Adam knew his wife Eve, or as in 1 Samuel, Elkanah knew his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her, and she became pregnant. The Lord recognized the genuineness of Abraham's spirit and that he had an unselfish concern for others, as well as a servant's heart. So what we are witnessing here is Elion, El the creator of all heaven and earth, interacting in a man's life, choosing him for an extraordinary task and adventure. So why was he chosen? I submit to you that the Lord perceives in Avram not only the ability, but also the potential to sincerely reflect the character of God to others and to represent Adonai before the rest of mankind. It is therefore in Genesis 18 that he employed Avraham to command his sons and his entire household to keep the way of Adonai by doing righteousness, tzedakah, and justice, mishpat. Righteousness and justice. These two are the words in the Hebrew Bible that are among the chief attributes and character traits of our God. In Psalm 97, it says, Adonai reigns, let the earth rejoice, let the many islands be glad. Clouds and darkness are all around him, but righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. So to help us better understand, allow me to say that the Hebrew word tzedek, or righteous, mainly concerns ethical conduct and moral actions that are expressed by a person. Basically, it means doing what is upright, doing what is decent, what is good and wholesome. The Hebrew word mishpat for justice refers to the proper administration of a law unto a person who is being judged. It is justice, regardless of whether the outcome is of a benefit or reward to the person receiving the judgment, or whether the outcome is punishment for a wrong committed. The decision will be undeniably correct. But back to Avraham, or Avram as he's called now. Should Avram follow God's directions 
Then the Lord would give Abraham what was on God's heart to give him. So, question, what is the Lord's intent? This is what the Lord uh, tells him. My heart's desire is to make you into a great nation, to bless you, to make your name great, so that you may be a blessing. My desire is to bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. I don't know about you, but I get the sense that God loves somebody. It must be said here that Abraham was 75 years old at the time. And in Haran, he had already attained status and prosperity all on his, uh, on his own. Yet there, yet right here, he was asked to start on a whole new life's journey. The Lord would promise him the land of Israel by covenant in Genesis 15. And he would become father, a father who would teach many, make disciples of many, and become the father of many nations. Paul states in Galatians 3 that this is an important foreshadowing of the gospel in Scripture in that God would justify the Gentiles, render them righteous by faith. In fact, in Genesis chapter 26, verse 4 and 5, here the Lord is speaking to Isaac, and this is later on, and he repeats to him the covenant that he made earlier with his father Abraham. He says, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and will give your descendants all these lands. And by your descendants, Isaac, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because Abraham, your father, he obeyed me and fulfilled his duty to me and kept my commandments and my statutes and my laws. I want to point out that this promise made to um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was made 4,000 years ago. This promise to give him the land by covenant was given to him 4,000 years ago. What land? Well, here's an image of uh, what many people kind of agree on, that this is probably most likely the, the area of land that was um, given to uh, Abraham and his descendants. It's basically from the river of Egypt in the south to the river Euphrates in the north. And you might ask, well, where is Israel today in all of this land that was promised to him? Well, I'm not sure if you could see it, but that little red circle there, that's uh, approximately, yeah, you have to kind of go like this, right? That's how small it is. That's the current uh, geography um, and the, of the surface area of Israel. So the Lord says, to your descendants, to your descendants, I give you this land from the river of Egypt to the river Euphrates. And then in um, Hebrews chapter 11, this is uh, from, taken from the book, of the book to the Messianic Jews, also known as the book of Hebrews. This is what the writer states. He says, by trusting, Abraham obeyed after being called to go out to a place which God would give him as a possession. Indeed, he went out without even knowing where he was going. By trusting, he lived as a temporary resident in the land of promise, as if it was not even his. He stayed in tents with Yitzhak and Yaakov, who were to receive what was promised along with him. By trusting, and obeying God, Abraham, when he was put to another test, later offered up his son Yitzhak as a sacrifice. That's his only son, the one through whom was received the promises, to whom it had been said, your seed would come forth. That was the promise of Mashiach. For Abraham had already concluded that God would, that he could even raise his son Isaac from the dead. Such was his faith. That test, known as the Akedah, or the binding of Isaac, 
was one of the 10 trials that Abraham would endure in his life. And the one that will truly resonate throughout all of eternity. So he obeyed God and he believed God. And in Genesis 15, God again promises childless Avram that he would have descendants. And he trusted Adonai, and Adonai accounted to him this as righteousness. In Romans chapter 4, Paul also compares Abraham's faith to David's, just as we will today. This then is how Paul explains what the scripture means when it says, and he trusted in Adonai. It is that Abraham did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, meaning that he was going to have to offer up his son. He didn't dilly-dally. He didn't give up. He didn't reject. He didn't refuse or turn down God's promise. But instead, he was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, being fully convinced that what God had promised, he was also able to perform. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. So how convinced was Abraham? It says he was fully convinced. So let's move on. When we read the rest of Abraham's life story, we see a person who wholeheartedly clung to and pursued God. He is known as a man of peace. He settled a boundary dispute with Lot. He showed compassion as he argues and bargains with God for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. He is a hospitable and gracious host to visitors. And in Genesis chapter 14, he showed himself also to be a quick-acting warrior as well. Yes, Abraham the warrior. Because he rescued Lot and his family from a raiding party. Right after that, you remember, that's when he meets with Melchizedek. Now, this was way before he rescued Lot again from Sodom and Gomorrah. <clears throat> We should also talk briefly about his potential weaknesses. Because it's important to remember that our forefathers and foremothers, just like us, you know, they were not perfect. He may have shown some fear during two other tests in his life. You may remember that he seemed a bit deceptive and appeared to worry about saving his own skin when he passed off his wife as his sister. This happened twice. First in Genesis 12, when Sarai was abducted by Pharaoh to be included in his um, harem. But then again, when she was taken by King Abimelech of Gerar in Genesis chapter 20. Now, he wasn't lying about her being his sister, because Sarai was the daughter of his father. But she was not the daughter of his mother. So in other words, she was his stepsister. He just didn't want to volunteer the fact that, he, that she was his wife. But what we find interesting is that following these two occurrences, guess what? God promised Abraham to be given, God caused Abraham to be given great riches from those two rulers because of their remorse and fear of God. So overall, if one was to summarize how God's character was reflected in Abraham's life as he walked with the Lord, it is in that God was manifested as a person of peace and familiarity, friendliness, right? I mean, think, Abraham was a nice guy. He was not a mean overlord. He didn't live in a castle with walls and wore a bodysuit of armor, didn't live in a fortified city. He was a man who was patiently camping out in a tent in the land that God said would be his. Similar to Adon Yeshua, Master Yeshua, when he came in the flesh. Abraham, the father of our faith, was known for his kindness, generosity, and hospitality, just like Yeshua. Add to that righteousness and justice, and we see why the Lord chose him. God wants us to see what he is like. The Lord wants us to get to know him. So let's move on and speak about David. Who is King David? And 
how is it that he was chosen by God and come to be known as a man after God's own heart? David was the youngest of the eight sons of Jesse from Bethlehem. He was chosen by God to be king over all Israel. He reigned over Israel for 40 years, around 1000 BC. And um, he concluded his life at age uh, 70. Uh, Abraham lived to age 175. So relative, relatively short. So why was he chosen? In 1 Samuel chapter 13, we hear Samuel giving King Saul a bit of a tongue lashing for his dis disobedience to the Lord and not neutralizing all the Amal Amalek Am Amalekites. He said, But now, Saul, your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Then later when Samuel is assessing Jesse's sons to, and to see who would receive the anointing to become the next king, the Lord instructed Samuel not to judge by appearance for the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance but the Lord looks at the heart. And in Acts chapter 13, the Lord said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, to be a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. So like Abraham, David is also a person in whom God sees the potential to show the world who he is, his character, and his attributes. So if God says that David is a man after his own heart, does that mean that if we do a deep dive into David's life, we will get a more intimate look at the heart of God? That sounds pretty wild, right? Question, do you want to know God more? Do you want to know Yeshua more? Well, when I was a young believer, God gave me an insightful book that I highly recommend. It's a book by Alan Redpath, and it's called The Making of a Man of God, Lessons from the Life of David. Alan does a fine job helping us understand how God shapes those who are responsive to his love. It also helps us to learn how David's faith, whether he was in the midst of massive trouble or even when he was at a place of tranquility, and how he knew to draw closer to God, and, sh and it also describes how he understood and reflected the mind of a perfect God. Let's do a quick review of David, the son of Jesse. Our first impression upon meeting David is that he seemed insignificant to others. His brothers brush him aside, they scold him, and they showed him very little respect. He was, a, he was just a young shepherd boy, yet he is very diligent, very hardworking. He cares for the sheep like nobody else. He was brave, compassionate, hardworking, and known to, for his great faithfulness to God. And he's also very respectful of authority. And not at all, as we all know, to, afraid to face God's enemies. Like with Abraham, God saw his heart. David has a flexible heart that is willing to learn and repent when he's reproved for wrongdoing. He shows remorse. He is not arrogant or prideful. He is known as a man of humility, thus a man after God's own heart. He has strong faith in God. When Saul chided him for volunteering to fight Goliath, David schooled the king, saying that while he was just a young boy, God delivered him from a lion and bear attacks, even enabling him to overcome them single-handedly. And he told Saul that he had trusted, he has trust in the Lord. He is repentant. When he is confronted with his own sin of taking another man's life, David showed true repentance. 
His confession is recorded in the, for, all to, for all of us to see in Psalm 51. The prophet Nathan further acknowledges that God has forgiven him when he said, the Lord also has put away your sin and you shall not die. But of course, there would be consequences and, he left, and his first son would not live. He has a heart for worship. He's known as a worshiper. He composed, arranged, and performed many of the songs and poems in the book of Psalms, and is known to dance in worship before the Lord with all of his might. And thank you, Michael, for being a, a, a good <laughs> a reflection of that when you join us in uh, dancing and worship. May more men do that. Um, He is also obedient. Despite having had several opportunities where he could have slain Saul, who was relentlessly chasing him, David refused to even harm Saul. It's not because he was afraid, but it's because he honored and respected Saul, who God had anointed to be the king over Israel. David loves God's word. That David expresses a profound appreciation and affinity for God's word, his laws, his commandments and precepts, meditating on them with his whole heart, can be seen in a psalm he wrote that has a whopping 176 verses based on this very subject. We are talking, of course, about Psalm 119, a beautifully arranged acrostic poem. It thoroughly extols the merits, virtues, and blessings available to us when we meditate on the excellencies of God's word. And lastly, he has a deep love for God. Throughout the Psalms, David wrote about his love for God with great passion. In Psalm 8, he declares the excellencies of God's name. In Psalm 18, he declares that he loves the Lord with all of his heart, soul, and strength. In Psalm 63, he yearns for God when he is in the wilderness, whether physically or emotionally. And in Psalm 139, he marvels at how God knows him intimately and loves him unconditionally. Again, this should remind us of the intimacy Adonai had with Abraham. David's love for God also, like Abraham's, was not just an intermittent conviction but something that was fundamental to who he was as a person. And it was this love that drove him to be faithful to God, no matter what the cost. As Abraham taught us of righteousness and justice, similarly, we will find with King David the following qualities about God towards us. God is righteous and just. Um, we covered that with Abraham, but in David's life, David is known to always listen to both sides of a dispute before he would make a decision. He made sure that everyone had a chance to speak. Thus, he was respected by not only his friends, but also by his enemies. And he was known as a man of honor and integrity. God is merciful. Let's look at David's life. He would often extend clemency to those who deserved it, even if... They were his enemies. Like when Saul was chasing him, even throwing a spear at him several times, David had plenty of opportunities to kill Saul. But he restrained himself because he knew that God had anointed Saul as king. And after Saul died, Saul genuinely mourned for the demented Saul and composed even a beautiful lament in his honor called the Song of the Bow. It's written in the book of Yasher. And if you don't have the book of Yasher on your, on your shelf at home, you can go to 2 Samuel chapter one. God is forgiving. As David grew older, his son Absalom led a rebellion a rebellion to take over his own father's kingdom. Now David could have had him killed for doing so, for treason to your own father. But 
Instead, he showed mercy and wept for his son when Absalom died. David's known to be trustworthy, just as the Lord is trustworthy. Because in his relationship with Jonathan, the son of Saul, we learn of a wonderful, close, and loving friendship that the two experienced together as they grew in faith. We know that David is courageous. You remember how he stood up against Goliath? So, like Joshua and Caleb, when they saw the occupiers of the promised land, he was not afraid of the giants. He engaged in numerous battles, and he always fought valiantly, to the point even that he garnered a lot of praise, honor, and admiration from the people, even more so than King David did. Dancing, the women would sing, Saul has killed the thousands, and David, his ten thousands. So I'm sorry if this list of these character traits that I'm giving you just seem to be going on and on. But yes, think of this. So is the list of attributes and love and concern that God has for us. Indeed, Mika Mocha Adonai, who is like you? So we talked about David, uh, who he was as a person. Uh, let's briefly look, briefly look at his accomplishments. He was the second king of Israel as ordained by God. He slew Goliath. He succeeded in expanding the territory of Israel. He defeated many of Israel's enemies. They're all, most of them are listed in 2 Samuel chapter 8. And he established Jerusalem as the capital city. Very important. And he brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, thereby helping to solidify Jerusalem's importance as the center of worship. He is also known as the architect of the first temple, based, basing it on detailed plans from God that was revealed to him through the prophet Nathan. And his king, his reign, um, his kingdom, or his, his reign, established a, pro, a powerful prophetic dynasty. And um, God also promised to make David's name great among the greatest men on earth. And so he did. In scripture, his name is mentioned 969 times. That's more than anyone else's. Even today, what are we doing? We're talking about David. We're still mentioning his name. The Lord promised him that from his offspring would come forth Messiah, of whom God said God would be his father and Messiah would be his son. This is in 1 Chronicles 17 and 1 Chronicles chapter 20. This Messiah would be a king whose throne and kingdom over Israel will be established forever. Yeshua is of the lineage of David, and rightfully he applied this description of being the son of God to himself. But David also was not a man without some areas of weaknesses. He had committed adultery and he had murdered the, the husband Uriah. And there's evidence that he also struggled with some lingering idol worship. For instance, in 1 Chronicles 14, after one battle, he credits God with breaking his enemy's force and giving him the victory. Yet curiously, he names the place Baal Peratzim, meaning Baal burst forth. Um, when David escaped out the window to evade the soldiers that were hot on his heels to kill him, you remember that his wife Michal took an idol, put an, a garment, over it and puts goat's hair on the, uh, uh, on, the, on the idol and put it under the cover so it looks like David was still right there. Brilliant move, right? But my question is, what is an idol doing in David's bedroom? And if it's, if it's not in his bedroom, what is this idol doing in his home? Just asking. 
Um, in 1 Samuel chapter 19, David had 19 sons. He didn't have them all at once, I said that wrong. It is listed in 1 Samuel 19 that he has 19 sons. And I don't even count to how many daughters he had. Um, well, in this, the 17th son, in 2 Samuel chapter 5, is named El Yada, for God knows. But if you look in 1 Chronicles chapter 14, we see that this very same son, that his real name is Baal Yada, meaning Baal knows. So why would he name his son, why would he name his son that? But I want to also say that King Saul did the same thing. In 1 Chronicles chapter 8, he named, one of, he named his son Esh Baal, meaning a man of Baal. So basically, we know that Abraham and David may have had some struggles with certain weaknesses and flaws, but these kingdom men remained faithful to God. Let's review what we set out to do from the beginning of this message. We have already discussed now who Abraham and David are, and hopefully we've gained greater insight to their lives and their character. And we have discussed how and why they were chosen. A big reason being so that we can see from these leaders what God is like. In conclusion, let's consider how this applies to you and me as, as disciples of Messiah. In Romans chapter 4, Rav Shaul says, even as Abraham's trusting in God was accounted to him for righteousness, it was not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will account righteousness. For us who believe in him, who raised Messiah Yeshua, our Lord, from the dead. So what did David and Abraham have in common? They both walked in God's ways. So what does it mean for us to walk in his ways? Well, look at that as a, as a metaphor for following God and, uh, and living for God, to abide in him. Yeshua said, if anyone will come and follow me, let him deny himself and take up his execution stake daily and follow me. Abraham and David, they expressed their reference, their worship, and their devotion to God, not only by their words, but also through their actions and their behaviors. They were well-rooted in their faith, and they were committed to placing God first in their lives. So walking in his ways, like abiding, means to sojourn with, to dwell with, to travel with, to spend time with, meditating on that person's sayings, meditating on God's word, and discovering what his will is for our lives. Psalm 128 says, would you please read these psalms with me as I read them, okay? Because uh, I think it'll be really wonderful and a chance to get our blood circulating again. Psalm 128, uh, please read with me. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Psalm 94. Blessed is the man whom you instruct, O Lord, and teach out of your law. Psalm 112. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights in his, greatly in his commandments. The wisest man on earth, it's, no, it's not Doug Friedman, but it's King Solomon. After his long and desperate search for true meaning and purpose in life, he discovered for us what it all boils down to. He said, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. 
Then he says, now that all has been heard and experienced by him, here is the conclusion of the matter, meaning a truly satisfying life. He says, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. The second wisest man on earth, Moshe Rabbeinu, he made the concept of walking with God clear to us as well. He said, and now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? He requires only that you fear the Lord your God, live in a way that pleases him, and love him and serve him with all your heart and soul. And you must always obey the Lord's commandments and decrees that I am giving you today for your own good. By looking at Abraham and David's lives, we can better understand what it is to abide in the vine, to walk with Yeshua. It is, like it is it was for these two men, a lifelong journey, but it will be a rewarding journey. As Abraham was tested many times, we know that his reward, and we know that his reward is great, so our lives also may be akin to a series of trials. Each step being an opportunity to grow and mature in our faith, remaining flexible like David to learn and repent and be remorseful when we stumble. Or like Avraham, with each encounter with the Lord, he gained the ability to trust God more and become even more patient. Consider Avraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, Jacob and Rachel. What did these three couples have in common? These, the progenitors of the Jewish people, they were all barren and unable to conceive in the natural. The sages say that it was so as to demonstrate that the descendants of God's chosen people would come about not in a natural order of things, but that it would be supernatural. It would be through much prayer and supplication and unmistakably be by the hand of God himself. All glory to Hashem. So in the Bible, when you are called to be, in the, in the Bible, when you are called to be a disciple, and we most certainly are called to be disciples of Yeshua, amen? What does it mean? What is the expectation in Scripture from a Hebraic sense, to be a disciple. It's a, it means to do what your teacher, Yeshua, does. We are to act like Yeshua. We are to pray like Yeshua, teach like Yeshua, love like him, think like him, walk like him. Yeshua is our perfect example. He is our master. And we are his disciples. And when we read about all the people of faith in Scripture, like we did today, and there's so many, many, many more, right? And as we represent them to our youth in Shabbat school, and that's something that's very important to us here in this congregation, we don't talk of them as legends, fables, folklore, myths, or stories. These are real kingdom men and women. And this is our history. Don't you just love that slide? Yeah. Because <laughs> you know what it means. Yeah. Okay. So in conclusion, as we are surrounded, the scripture says, by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us therefore get rid of every weight and entangling sin. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, focusing on Yeshua, the initiator and perfecter of faith. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. And then he has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. At this point, the writer of the Psalms would say, Selah. Um, let's pray unto the Lord.
this prayer. Abba, Father, Lord God Almighty, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and God of David, holy and revered is your name. Your kingdom will come. It has come. Lord God, thank you so much for blessing us today, Lord, as brothers and sisters, as your children, Lord. Thank you for giving us new life through Messiah Yeshua. Thank you for giving us your word and your commandments and your precepts to show us who you are and how you love us and what your character is and what your will is. Thank you, Lord, that through these men that we talked about today, you show yourself to be a loving, kind, generous, patient person. Lord, have mercy on us. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness and from our sins. Wash us by the blood of Messiah Yeshua, Lord. For we wish and desire to serve you. And we are grateful, Lord, to be your children, to be a part of your kingdom of men and women. Blessed be the name of Messiah Yeshua, in whose name we pray. Amen.